Good afternoon, everybody. If you would like to come and join us, we're just going to have a briefing and a little conversation. So I'm Justin Forsyth. I'm the Deputy Executive Director of UNICEF, and I'm delighted to be here this afternoon with Melissa Fleming, who I think you all know from UNHCR. Um, I've all, we've also got two very um, special guests, um, Natasha Mamba and Minahil Safrez. Um, Natasha is from Zimbabwe and um, Minahil is from Pakistan and they're both refugees and they're here um, a, as part of youth activists trying to influence the outcomes of the very important meetings today and tomorrow. I thought we would start and we're going to have a bit of a conversation um, with Natasha and Minahil, but I thought I'd start and ask Melissa, if she wouldn't mind, to say a few words, given we're a few hours now into this very important summit today, about what sh what's really struck her about the opening and the commitments that are being made and the very important um, document that is being agreed today. So, Melissa, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Justin, and thanks for having me. You know, I, um, UNHCR is based in Europe, and it wasn't until this past year when all of the refugees started coming to Europe and didn't remain in the um, developing countries where most of them are based, that was when the world started to take notice. Um, and that's when the world started to ask, why are they coming? And we at UNHCR and at UNICEF and, uh, had the opportunity to say, oh, okay, now you're ready to listen. We'll tell you, because the conditions for refugees are terrible because the humanitarian organizations like UNHCR and UNICEF who are trying to help refugees are completely and acutely underfunded um, and the countries that are hosting them uh, are also not getting the kind of investment that they deserve. For example, Lebanon has 25 percent of its population is now refugees. There are towns and villages I've visited that have more refugees than uh, citizens. And half of the kids are not in school, the refugee kids. This is shameful. In fact, and I'm just going to put this statistic out there, um, only one in two refugee children are in primary school. When it gets to the secondary level, it gets even worse. One in four uh, refugee children make it to secondary school. And then when you come to the university level, it's only 1% of refugee children uh, get to university. Something is really wrong with this picture. And so I think that the, the alarm bell went off. 50% uh, of the world's refugees are children. Um, and there are many more children on the move. 65 million people forcibly displaced. I think finally the world leaders recognize it's time to do something about it. And that's why we're here today at the United Nations at the General Assembly. UNHCR is really pleased with the New York Declaration that was adopted this morning. It's probably not going to radically and overnight uh, change the, the situation for refugees right away, but it is a really important start, especially at a time when things were unraveling, um, when we're seeing uh, populist politicians um, you know, direct their vitriol towards people on the move and distort the whole, uh, uh, the whole narrative. Right now, what the world 194 leaders said, refugee rights are irrefutable. We have to protect refugees and we have to improve the conditions under which they live. We have to get refugee children into school. Um, and so that's why I'm really pleased to be sitting here um, and having this conversation with, with representatives um, of the refugee community like you. Thank you, Justin. Thank you very much, Melissa. I'm not going to introduce um, Natasha or Minahil because I would like them to tell their own stories. And so my first question to them is to say a little bit about yourselves. How did you end up being a refugee? What happened and what it's been like and some of the journey that you've been on? Do you um, want to start, Natasha? Uh, hi, my name's Natasha, and I'm 14. I um, came to Ireland when I was nine years old in 2011, and um, we left Zimbabwe because we believed that the political situation like, put our lives at risk, and it was best for us to leave um, as Zimbabwe. Um, I've been living in the direct provision system in um, 
in Ireland for five, for f about four years, and um, overall I've been in Ireland for five and a half years. And say a little bit, what's it like being a, being a refugee in Ireland, and before becoming a refugee, when you were just applying? I mean, um, bef before I became a refugee, obviously, you know, you were worried about, are they going to accept you? Are they going to allow you to remain in their country? Are they going to give you the protection you need? And even though I didn't know um, every single detail about the reason we left Zimbabwe, I knew that my mother wouldn't have just, you know, gotten up and left if it wasn't for something really important. And so just kind of that fear of, you know, my life is in their hands was, was, a, was a huge thing that, that at the end of the day kind of bothered me. But, you know, even as a refugee now, there's a lot of stuff, a lot of negatives that I've carried on from being an asylum seeker. Um, my, my identity is a huge thing, you know, I don't feel like I belong as much as I would love to feel. Um, I, I feel like I don't have a home, I'm, I'm not considered any nationality, and that's a huge thing, not knowing your identity, and I think that'll always kind of, it'll always kind of be a thing for me where I'm questioning where I belong, and um, I guess just you don't feel the same as every other child uh, in Ireland or everyone in your class or in your school just because you don't have, they're just little things that are not the same. Great, thank you Natasha. Minahil, would you like to tell us your story a little bit? Um, hello, I'm Minahil Sarfraz. I'm 15 years old and I arrived in Ireland when I was five years old, so that was in 2006. Um, and I've been living in Ireland for 10 years. So when I came, I was very young. I didn't know what was happening. All I knew was that I had left everything to come to this land that I didn't know about, kind of like a fairy tale gone wrong. So for me, when I looked at my mother crying every day, it brought me sadness to an extent I'd never faced before. And I really always asked her, like, what, what's wrong? Like, what's happening? She wouldn't tell me because I was too young to know. But I think that because of that situation, it has given me, like, the strength to help the children who don't have a voice, who don't have that hope that they're missing that and they're missing their childhoods. And I want to give it to them because I've lost it. I know how it feels. And I don't want anyone to feel that way, ever. And Minahil, what was the most important support you got when you, you know, growing up in Ireland as a, as a refugee? For me, um, the biggest support was school. Because school is where you just enter and you feel like a kid again. It doesn't matter about your situation, where you're from, what's happening, the emotions that are poisoning you, they just disappear once you enter school. You're like, I have to focus on my future. And that's what I wanted to do, because if I didn't be a doctor, if I didn't be a politician, I don't know how I could help the environment uh, that I lived in. And how can I help the world community if I don't have that position that politicians have or that um, knowledge that doctors have? And I want that knowledge and I want that position so I can make the changes that are missing in this world, that need to come and I want to bring them. So we've heard um, from Minna Hill Natasha that she wants to be both a politician <laughs> and a doctor. Um, do you have an ambition for what you would like to be in a few years' time? Um, I'd love to be a biochemist, uh, mainly because I really love, I love science. And um, one of the things I love about science is, you know, everyone's the same, everyone's made of the same things, and, and we operate the same, which is just a lovely thing to know. You know, it takes your mind off knowing that you're not equal as someone, but you're still human, you know, you're both humans. And I think that's just a lovely thing about science. There's no discrimination. Well, I, I can't believe you're 14 and you're 15. <laughs> I think uh, probably, what you just said reminds me of this, there was this in interview by this very famous rap star in Germany and he interviewed this, this young kid just randomly and it was filmed and, it, and the film went viral because he asked the kid, 
Um, are there? An, it was during the huge refugee crisis last year. Are there any foreigners in your class? And he looked at him like really perplexed and said, "No, there are no foreigners. They're just children." And this reminds me of, of your T-shirt, um, which is it really struck me when everybody was coming into the General Assembly today. We had a whole lineup of, of children wearing this T-shirt, and and it reminds me of a lot of what you were saying about the you know identity. You want to be a scientist because we're all the same, but yet you became a refugee as a young child, and you were labeled a refugee, and then you you started questioning your identity. Can you tell me a little bit about the T-shirt and what it feels like? I mean, um, even when I got this T-shirt, there was just such a strong message behind it. And I mean, anyone can take it the way they want, but the words on this T-shirt. But I mean, I took it as in like, you know, I'm not a refugee and I'm not a migrant. And I wasn't a refugee first. I wasn't a migrant first. I was a child first. And I deserve to be treated like a child and I am a child. <laughs> A very strong message. Minahil, you're, as you say, an aspiring politician as well as an aspiring doctor. And at the moment, you're an activist as well as a young person. What would, what would you say, and what have you already said? Because I know you've had quite high-level meetings today already to leaders attending this summit. I want to tell them, one day you were a child. There was a possibility that you could have been labeled as a refugee. There was a possibility you could have been labeled as a migrant. Put yourself in that position. Think about it for a second. How would you feel if someone, you were forced to flee from your country, from your home, leave everything, come to a place where you don't know and where you're not treated well? Would you survive there? I mean, I respect every child who's, who's right now a refugee or a migrant because they have courage. They're brave enough to just stand for it. I, I'm sad that I had to face that situation, but I'm even more angry that there are more children safe, uh, suffering. So why is this happening? Why didn't we solve it ages ago? Like This has been here since the beginning of time, and we've had all that time to fight back and do what we believe is best. Is this what you believe is best, to just leave it as it is and not do anything. I am so glad that we just made an agreement right now. I am so happy. You know, my stress is just relieved right now. I just want to see what comes out of it. If nothing comes out of it, I'm just going to think it's just false hope, a waste of time. But I hope, I hope that it's not a waste of time and it's not false hope. I want something to come out of it. Thank you very much. So I think we're going to open now for questions to anybody, any um, or, or of us four um, from the floor. So does anybody want to jump up and ask any questions or make a point? Yes, you can. Hello? Hi. So what is the most important thing for us to be able to tell people, if there's one point or one piece of a message that you want us to share with people, what is it that you would like us to share for the crisis? I think that, like a lot of people said, I've been listening for the past uh, one day, two days, um, a lot of uh, leaders were saying that we should address the source. And I think that it's very accurate. We should be addressing the source because in order to save humanity from this crisis, we need to stop it happening again and we have to stop the root causes. The wars that are happening and the conflict and the violence is not the fault of the child. It's not the fault of the children and they shouldn't be suffering. So please stop fighting over things that are, that are costing lives. They're costing a lot, and you're destroying a lot. So um, just do the best for everyone. I think the main thing about the refugee crisis is, um, you know, why has it taken so long to get to this point where we're talking about it and where we're actually uh, contemplating it? Um, does it really have to take a lot of children dying and a lot of children suffering um, before we get to a point where we even just start 
you know, talking about it. This issue should have been dealt with when it started so that we didn't have to see and we don't have to see the amount of children we see suffering, especially with, you know, the, the, um, the refugee crisis around now. But I mean, even children who are living as asylum seekers, um, you know, this, they're not, you're taking away so much from a child when you label them or when you ignore them for as long as we've been ignored. And I think um, as good as it is that, you know, this week is dedicated to us, um, this should have been done a long time ago. Yeah, I mean, I think what you said, address the root causes is really key. I mean, we keep, every year, UNHCR seems to be coming out with, with there are 10 million more people than the year before who've been forcibly displaced from their homes. So refugees are like a mirror that shine back on the health of the world. And it basically shows that um, the world has been unable to resolve the conflicts. We have refugees who've been sitting in camps or in exile for 20 years, too many. Um, and so they can't go home, and then new conflicts spring up, and more people are forced to flee. And yet there's, even for the victims of these conflicts, there's far too little being done, and there's far too little being done to stop the wars. So I think, the recognition, this declaration today is the beginning um, of, a, you know, an acknowledgement. We need a game-changing um, switch right now. We need to switch gears because the world we're living in right now, it's unacceptable for refugees, and ex especially um, it's wrong for refugee children and migrant children as well. Just to add maybe one point and then I'll come to you. One of the things that actually uh, Melissa's boss said yesterday, Filippo Grandi, the High Commissioner for Refugees, which really shocked me even though I knew this was very big, which, which is uh, an issue that we highlighted in our recent report, Uprooted, which is about children who are refugees or migrants or displaced, is that a million children in the world are in detention because of their refugee or migrant or status. And we know children are being locked up in Europe, in many parts of the world, um, while they're being processed um, in terms of their legal status. And w I think that's completely unacceptable. We know many of those children will be frightened, they'll be being abused, and so um, we shouldn't be locking up children. And I hope some of the commitments made in this summit will lead to finding practical alternatives so we're not locking up children, something specific. Um, for you. There's a question, I think, at the back. Oh. Oh, you want to go first. Okay, we'll share, I promise. Hi, thank you all very much. It's a very powerful comments and I think drawing a lot of amazing attention to specific points within the refugee crisis. And I'm curious from each of you, what you see as the biggest challenges or maybe one of the most important challenges that need to be overcome and hurdles to be overcome in order to see more success in this area? Um, I think that a lot of people should be more welcoming to the refugees because I know that when I was in the situation that I came to Ireland um, without um, anyone to talk to really, um, a lot of people were like, oh, look at those refugees. Um, they shouldn't be here. But we should be here because this is our world. We can go wherever we like. We shouldn't be stopped by people who don't believe in um, living together as humans and as brothers and sisters. So I think uh, children and adults should be educated on that fact and that they should know that there's not much difference between all of us. We're the same, just with different personalities and beliefs. I think um, education's the biggest, the biggest hurdle. I think um, we're denying a lot of children education, whether it's you know um, primary school or, or, or secondary school or, or third level education. I mean, denying any child the right to, to prosper in life is one thing that causes so many of the problems in our world, like conflict and terrorism. It's because we're excluding people from we're excluding people from, from a world where there's so much opportunity. And I mean, we, we forget that we're not the only people. We forget that, you know, 
there are others who are struggling and have less than us, and our job is to make sure that everyone has equal rights to us and can get the education we got, which is really important, important for all our refugee and migrant children. Well, I, I just want to second that because I, I, I always just thought I really did not understand why the world is not investing more in refugee education. Um, I think it's not right, but I also think it's dumb <laughs> because, you know, refugees, every refugee I've ever met has said they want to go home at some point and they want to help rebuild their country. They want to be, if educated, uh, the, the architects, the engineers, uh, the teachers, the politicians, they want to bring about reconciliation and peace. Um, and yet, we're not investing in their education. And as the international community who is trying to stop the war, trying to stop the cycle of violence, and yet not giving the tools to the people who could actually do it, um, is short-sighted. And uh, so I, I, I really hope, even if it's in just the you know, enlightened self-interest of the international community that finally um, there will be investment in education. There's a pledge today in the declaration that every refugee and migrant um, in an emergency situation should very quickly be put in school. I think tomorrow there's a summit meeting that uh, President Obama has called that will be here. And I don't know the outcome yet, but I'm hearing um, encouraging signs that there are going to be concrete pledges, particularly in the area of education. So. I'm hopeful that things are going to get better. Um, I'm Naomi from Liberia. Um, whenever I hear about refugee crisis, I feel it's so personal to me because 14 years of my life, I was this place of refugee or, or refugee. It is important as it relates to education because I had the opportunity to go to school while I was in Africa's. Now I'm back in my home leading an organization called Community Healthcare Initiative that provides healthcare and social services to the underprivileged, those in the slum communities. When you are a refugee, you are denied of so many things that are essential to you. You don't want to stay in other people's home. You want to go back home. So being a refugee puts you in the position that most of the decision that you make is not based on what you want, but what is available to you. So if they are provided affordable education, they can go back home. And going back home is just the first step because when you return home, there will be a whole lot of work to be done. There will be young people that need to be rehabilitated. There will be people that need to go on a cycle of social counseling. And you need the additional themselves, the people themselves to do it. That's why we promote localization. Because if they are not educated, you have to bring people from other countries to, to do the work that the locals are supposed to be doing. And the people within the community understand the community themselves than people that enter in the community. So thank you. I agree with you. That's exactly what I was trying to say. You just said it so much better. Yeah. Would you like to add anything? Would you like to? One of the, I mean, just to reinforce that point is that I think not just in your situation in Africa, but also one of the challenges in terms of education in Syria and in the neighboring countries is that many of the teachers have also fled and they might be in Turkey or Lebanon or Jordan and those teachers can also teach in those as refugee teachers and often they're not allowed to so I think we need to find better and more flexible ways to allow education to continue so that many um, children can keep learning. Is there anybody else who would like to ask a final question. I know we've only got two minutes left. Or should we ask our panel to give some final remarks? OK, Natasha, do you want to say a final thought? I think um, going on from, from this whole week, uh, of the main thing is, is action. You know, we need to start like taking you know action towards what we want and what we talk about because there's there's absolutely no point in talking about issues and saying this is what we need to do and not doing it. So I hope that in the near future we can see our world take action on these issues. I think that we've come a long way from being a society that doesn't listen to children. So I'm so happy that finally children are being heard. And I think that this week just shows that we are finally realizing our mistakes 
and how much our mistakes were costing us. So hopefully, if it goes well, we'll have a carefree world and a world where everybody is equal. Thank you, everyone. Well, with that, I think we'll wrap up. And a huge thank you to Minahil and to Natasha and to Melissa and all of you for attending today. And I hope, as they've all said more eloquently than I can, that we'll put children first in these discussions and we'll make sure whether you're a migrant, you're displaced or a refugee, that we really make that message um, be heard that you're a child first and that we need that action that you talked about. So thank you very much for coming.